I'm Lynn Bondrant, coming to you from NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. This program, Between the Atom and the Star, is the second program of the television series, Life in the Universe. During this series, we are seeing how man has learned to live in space beyond the protective atmosphere of Earth, and we'll also see how man is looking for life beyond Earth. Between the Atom and the Star is a motion picture produced in 1965 by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. As you will see during the film, the purpose of the biosatellite project was to find out what problems man might face during long space missions. Now let's see the film. There are moments in the history of science when the invention of a tool suddenly accelerates the accumulation of knowledge. Magnification revealed worlds beyond worlds. and worlds within worlds. But these worlds of the atom and the star have always been separated by a vast gulf, waiting for another tool that could bring them together. With the flights of the biosatellite, biologists will have the unprecedented opportunity of studying some of the forces which influence every form of life, from single cells and developing eggs on up through plants and primates but which cannot be entirely studied on the ground. For the biosatellite is a very special kind of biological laboratory in space, where man's presence is represented by instrumentation. Since the acceleration of the orbiting biosatellite equals the acceleration of gravity of the Earth, it will be weightless. Now, why is this important? because weightlessness is a vital factor in any study of the influence of gravity on living organisms. Earth in its entire history probably has known only what we call a 1G environment. This means that an acceleration of about 32 feet per second per second is constantly pulling everything toward the center of the Earth. All living forms have evolved under 1G. Naturally, we're not especially aware of it because such a condition is normal in our lives. By substituting centrifugal force for acceleration, we can study most of the effects of gravity from 1G on up the scale, right here on Earth. So the question can legitimately be asked, what if life on Earth were to experience some other gravitational unit from 1G down to zero? Would it have any profound effect on its development? Where then can we find out what will happen to living organisms if we were to remove gravity completely? Even out in space, there is some gravity. Actually, at the distance the biosatellite will be orbiting, there's still 95% of the Earth's gravity. It is the free fall of the satellite that gives us the weightless laboratory we need. Here then, in the biosatellite, biologists can conduct experiments on living organisms in the weightless state, and then, by recovering the specimens and comparing their findings to the immense amount of data they have already collected on Earth, find out just what the effects are. The information they get will shed light on the fundamental processes of life and have vital applications to the field of manned spaceflight. Now, the basic objective in doing this kind of a program is to ask questions. Some of the leading biologists in our country have submitted experiments to NASA. They are being selected by NASA on the recommendation of outstanding biologists serving on NASA's own advisory committees and those of the National Academy of Sciences. These men examine each proposed experiment to see if it is a valid experiment, and equally important, if it is capable of being conducted in flight. Chairing the meeting is the director of the NASA Bioscience Program, Dr. Orr E. Reynolds. And our purpose of this meeting is to review the experiments that have been selected and proposed for the biosatellite flight series. Uh, Here then, at this meeting in the University of Colorado, we'll hear a few of the questions that are being asked about life on every level of organization. 
The first of these questions is going to be presented to us by Dr. Richard Young of Ames Research Center. The uh, question we're asking is primarily whether gravitational field or the absence of gravitational field has a, a fundamental effect on the ability of a cell to divide normally. Uh, we're using two experimental tools with which to ask this question, namely the frog egg and the sea urchin egg. We feel that uh, uh, a cell is fundamentally a cell. It really doesn't matter uh, for the purposes of this question whether it comes from a human being, a frog, or a sea urchin. The basic cellular phenomena we're studying here are essentially the same. Under normal conditions, when an egg is fertilized, some very dynamic events take place and in a very precise manner. After a certain period of time, depending on the temperature, the fertilized egg divides into two cells those two into four, and four into eight, and so forth. For many hours, all the cells will remain basically the same, but after a certain period of time, they're going to change. Some will become differentiated into nerve cells, some into skeletal cells, or muscle cells. Now, there's a lot we don't know about what causes these changes. We'd like to know if these significant events are altered in any way by gravity. So we start out with as simple an experimental concept as you can possibly come up with. Is the sperm, which is a biological entity in itself, capable of fertilizing an egg, another biological entity, in the absence of a gravitational field? Does the egg, once it's fertilized, proceed to divide normally without gravity, or is 1G, which is all life on Earth ever experiences, necessary for normal development? We use a sea urchin egg for one part of the experiment because we have a lot of background information on it, and it can be very easily handled in the laboratory. We can fertilize the eggs at will. They behave in a very precise and clock-like fashion, provided the environment is kept the same. The sea urchin egg has no known specific response to gravity. If we turn it over as it develops, it will still develop normally. So we expect to see no profound effect caused by zero G. The second part of the experiment is to use another biological system, the frog egg. Here we're asking the same question, but unlike the sea urchin egg, the frog egg requires a very specific orientation with respect to gravity in order for it to divide normally. You see, in nature, the frog egg sits in a mass of jelly. Once you fertilize it, it will immediately orient itself with respect to gravity. Now, if you take this egg and turn it over so it's upside down, it will simply roll over again and reorient itself. If you keep it upside down, however, while the egg is developing, something happens. The egg continues to divide, but forms abnormal twins or other malformations. So we have two systems with a very different response to a gravitational field on Earth. We want to compare these two systems and their response to gravity and to no gravity. The experiment is designed very simply. During the zero-g phase of the flight, when the biosatellite is experiencing no gravity, a simple device will inject sperm into a chamber containing the eggs and water. If the eggs are fertilized at all, some will be allowed to continue to develop throughout the three-day flight. Others, however, according to plan, will be killed and fixed so that later, upon recovery, we will study the results under the microscope. We, of course, are interested in many more questions about cells, including cells in higher plants and animals. Our experiment is an attempt to answer the question, how does a plant grow in the state of weightlessness? We know that the growth and development of higher plants is gravity dependent. That is, a plant root grows in the downward direction, the stem or shoot grows upward. Somehow, the plant is able to sense the gravitational vector and to use this information as a guide to its growth and development. We do not fully understand how the plant senses gravity, and we know even less about the way in which it uses the information to guide its morphogenetic development. In some organisms, we know rather clearly how gravity is sensed, because these creatures have special organs to accomplish this. In many invertebrates, there is a sac in which there is a small, stony ball. The ball is acted on by gravity and stimulates the sides of the sac, sensory hairs or cells. A crayfish, for example, finds a pebble, which he places into a hole in his head and uses it as a gravity sensor in this way. Plants do not have structures of this sort, at least not on a macroscopic scale. 
But within individual plant cells, there must be some kind of gravity sensor, and we would like to know what these are. The experiment was designed by Dr. Dahl from the University of Minnesota and myself. The experimental plant is called Arabidopsis. It is small and has a very short life cycle. The experiment consists of a series of chambers in which plants will be grown, uh, each chamber having appropriate life support system, and the plants will be started at different stages. They will be followed by time-lapse photography during the course of the flight, and after recovery, these plants will be taken back to the laboratory and analyzed uh, microscopically so that the internal anatomy uh, can be revealed. We will then be able to compare the plants which were grown during the zero-g experience in the biosatellite with plants grown in the laboratory in a normal gravitational field under exactly the same conditions. Another factor which we know of that produces abnormalities is radiation. Anticipating radiation in space, however, is very difficult because solar flares can make the amount many times greater in local areas than you would expect. These solar flares emit particles which have extremely high energy and constitute a hazard for manned spaceflight. Now, if you put these two factors together, radiation and weightlessness, you may get a combined or synergistic effect, one which is even greater than you would expect. One group of biosatellite experiments will be looking for genetic or heredity damage caused by weightlessness combined with radiation. Another group will be looking for somatic or non-inheritable effects on living organisms. Since uh, solar flare radiation, unfortunately, is not under our control, it was decided to provide an artificial radiation source on board of the satellite. The solar and cosmic radiation will, of course, be measured in addition, but this is expected to be low since the satellite will be flying at a relatively low altitude and geomagnetic latitude. During orbit, the radiation from our source will be directed onto some of these specimens. This will give us the effects of radiation combined with weightlessness. Other specimens will be shielded from the radiation. They will show the effects of weightlessness alone. Well, the living system that we work with is a very, very interesting one. This is the flower beetle, a little insect, maybe three millimeters long, called the Tribolium confusum. But this little beetle will live in dry flower. A few cubic inches of air and dry flower keeps it very happy for weeks on end. My colleague, Dr. John Slater, is in charge of this experiment. He has found this animal has many interesting properties and a very complicated developmental cycle. First, it lays eggs. The eggs will produce larval stages, and then they go into the pupal stage. Finally, the finished insect emerges. Techniques have been developed to separate and harvest each stage by using light and screens of different sizes. It's the pupae we are interested in. These pupae of the tribolium are definitely gravity-oriented, though they don't have any known gravity sensors. If you tip them over, in 10 minutes, they all will be back in a normal position. If they experience radiation, the pupae are very sensitive to developmental damage. That is, later, abnormalities develop in the wing of the adults and elsewhere. So here we have an insect with a quantitatively measurable defect, one that will occur in the course of development as a result of radiation on the ground. Will these radiation abnormalities be worse when we combine them with weightlessness? My own interest is in the daily rhythms which all organisms show in their activity. I'm interested in questions about the control and the precision of these rhythms and the extent to which they play an essential role in the physiological well-being of organisms. All of these questions are of considerable interest for the space program as I hope to show you. 
The most familiar of these rhythms is that of sleeping and waking. Less obvious is a similar rhythmicity in body temperature and the details of much of the chemistry of cells and tissues in general. In constant conditions of light and temperature, the period of these rhythms is only an approximation to that of a day. We call them circadian, meaning about a day. In nature, the daily light cycle controls their period to precisely 24 hours. We know these rhythms to be innate to the living material. Most biologists, in fact, regard their precision and stability as also of internal origin. But a few others believe these remarkable features are due to control by some so far unidentified 24-hour cycle in the Earth's environment, acting as a sort of pacemaker. We should be able to settle this question of an external pacemaker or not by the satellite experiment. If the precision and stability of the rhythms do not depend on inputs with a 24-hour periodicity, they will persist normally in the 90-minute Earth orbit. If they do depend on them, the rhythm will be drastically affected by the conditions of the flight. The test we have in mind will consist of studying the circadian rhythms of locomotion and body temperature in a hamster or a pocket mouse during 21 days of orbital flight. Both the locomotion and the body temperature will be recorded every 10 minutes and stored on tape for later analysis in a computer. The question at stake is simply this. Does the rhythm persist with the precision and stability that characterizes it on the ground? There are other features of circadian rhythms of interest to space engineers. If we suppress these circadian rhythms in some organisms, if we keep tomato plants, for example, in constant light and temperature, they get sick. But the resulting damage is promptly repaired when they are again allowed to see a light or a temperature cycle. The implication here is clear. Normal physiological functioning, at least for tomatoes, depends on the normal functioning of the rhythmic system. If this is also true for man, the further implication is equally clear for the tasks of engineering prolonged space flights for man. As you know, some results have already materialized from the short duration flights made by astronauts, which have serious implications. Some of these are loss of calcium, changes in blood pressure, and changes in the degree of alertness or attention. Clearly, it must be determined before man is subjected to any prolonged space journey what the toll of the space environment may be. Yes, uh, so far with the astronauts, what measurements have been made have been rather limited in scope, uh, particularly in terms of the circulatory and biochemical reflection of the effects of weightlessness. Or on the electrical level, unless we can correlate these with the previous findings that have been made so extensively in animals, particularly in the monkey. Exactly. And uh, these measurements uh, will permit us to interpret the otherwise limited findings that have been made on the astronauts to date. Now, the aim of our experiment is very simple. Uh, we want to see what happens to the blood circulation during weightlessness and uh, equally important, what happens to it again when the force of gravity is reapplied. For example, during re-entry and recovery. Now, an individual five and a half to six feet tall, such as the astronauts, uh, has quite a column of fluid represented from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. To keep the blood circulating, the heart has to pump against this hydrostatic head of pressure. When the individual lies down, of course, he reduces this head of hydrostatic pressure to a matter of a few inches instead of several feet. The system no longer has to cope with the load of gravity. Now, it's been known for many years that if you take even healthy people and put them to bed for a period of a few days or more, that the blood circulation resets itself, but in a way that we don't quite understand. When an individual goes into a weightless state, a comparable thing apparently happens. This whole hydrostatic head of pressure, all of this weight load on the circulation is removed, and now we have an individual in this condition for a matter of weeks or even months. Then there's another factor compounding the problem. 
From the same bed rest studies and from uh, reports of the short flights by astronauts, we know that they will be losing calcium too, perhaps because they've not been using the general weight-bearing components of the body, their skeleton and much of their musculature, which they usually need to support themselves in a 1G environment. So now the astronaut's bones are possibly more porous and brittle, and he becomes less able to withstand weight. The possibility of fracture becomes quite real, particularly when subjected to high g-forces of re-entry, when he's exposed to a very heavy and severe g-loading. How weak will his bones be? Can his circulatory function now cope with this added burden? We don't know, and we must find out. So that's what we'll try to do to make some quantitative measurements to see what happens to the blood circulation in a fully conscious primate. We'll measure the usual things, heart rate, blood pressure, but that's not enough. We also want to measure the quantity of blood the heart pumps out per minute, the actual volume flow of blood. And we'll collect all of the urine that the monkey produces during this period of time, analyze it, and make a judgment as to the kind of biochemical adjustments that have occurred. For instance, we'll be able to measure its calcium loss and determine exactly what has happened to the skeletal system. Well, another area that we must investigate is the effect of weightlessness on the central nervous system. And this is particularly true where weightlessness is combined in the spacecraft with isolation and confinement. We already know from work that we've done that the effect of isolation alone is very profound on judgment and judgment capability. And when isolation is combined with weightlessness and with confinement, the effects on the central nervous system may be so profound that we must investigate these problems specifically. Now, the astronaut doesn't have to have very much. All he has to do is not to be able to think very fast, and he's lost. Apparently, detachment at the time of re-entry is of the gravest concern. The man may not recognize that anything unusual has happened at all. This is one of the most serious dangers because the changes in his degree of alertness are very subtle. The attention of physiologists in the last 30 years has been intensively directed to an investigation of brain mechanisms. We surgically implant electrodes into the brain of the animal, and this in no way hurts him or impairs his ability to function. And then we can look at certain electrical patterns called brain waves coming from the brain. And from many years of investigation, we can come to know what levels of consciousness they reveal. Now, it would be an exaggeration to say that these studies are complete, but there is enough background information on the electrical activity of the brain so that we can relate this activity to the mechanisms in the brain that control sleep and wakefulness and unconsciousness, and more recently, to the finer aspects of focusing of attention, the performance of learned tasks and the ability to remember. From a behavioristic point of view, then, we will give the animal a task to perform during the flight, such as, for example, pressing a lever to get his food, or coordinating his eye and hand movements in grasping a pellet from a moving window. We will carefully test this coordination between eye and hand movements. It is something which, in a weightless state, is likely to undergo quite significant deterioration and may not necessarily recover. Well, if he doesn't press the lever at all, you can make assumptions that he has forgotten how to work the panel. But he might be in some unconscious state due to some environmental change. If the animal is not conscious, we want to know why. And without brain activity being recorded, we would never know. We plan a very rigorous analysis of the best possible portions of the data during the flight from the most representative areas of the brain. And this data will be fed into a computer which will give us a continuous microscopic look at the brain waves over a period of 30 days. Now that we have seen the film Between the Atom and the Star, which preceded the biosatellite launches, I'll comment on what happened during the missions. Actually, there were three biosatellites launched between 1966 and 1969. During the first mission, 
The biology experiments were successful, but the retro rockets did not fire and the life forms were not returned to Earth. The second mission was the most completely successful one. It was launched on September 7, 1967. Two days later, a capsule ejected from the satellite was caught in midair by an airplane and returned to Earth for analysis. Carried on board the satellite were such creatures as amoebas and fruit flies, flower beetles, parasitic wasps, and bullfrog eggs. Plants included wheat, peppers, and an herb called Tradescantia. Among the things we learned were that growth of wheat seedlings in space appeared to be normal. Also, stresses produced during launch and the weightlessness of orbit did not produce big changes in the internal functions of the amoeba, a simple one-celled animal. The third mission was between June 29th and July 7th, 1969. A pigtail monkey named Bonnie was carried into orbit. Bonnie was successfully returned to Earth, but died a short time later. Death was attributed to complications from weightlessness during flight and a lower than normal body temperature. Biosatellite results helped us in the continuing manned space program. The next program is called Zero G in Spacesuits. This is Lynn Bondurant saying goodbye till then from NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you.